My name is Jane Treger. Welcome to Talking Art. We're here at the Deerfield Arts Bank, and in August, it's closed. But we're in here filming an interview with Guillermo Cuellar, who is our next artist to be interviewed. <laughs> Are you ready, Guillermo? I'm as ready as I could ever be. Good. So, um, we have a lot of things to look at today, and they're quite large. You are a man of expansive Sometimes. vision. Some, yes, vision is the key okay, word. Okay, let's start with this fellow who is called the visionary. The visionary, yes. Yes. Uh, well, I was doing, my creativity was focused on social change. And I was doing a lot of training in uh, the, U the U.S. through corporate America, uh, doing diversity training. And uh, the at the beginning of 2000, I was in this uh, crossroads between being burned out and wanting my creativity to be expressed. And this guy just came out as I removed the rest of the stone out of it. It what, came out. What kind of so stone is this? This is soapstone, very easy to work. Anybody can do it. Where do um, you get soapstone? Uh, actually, I got that soapstone in Vermont. There's a few quarries in Vermont, so I uh -huh. just went and got it at the quarry. Now, <clears throat> Guillermo, not only do you have a Latin American or Spanish name, you have an accent, so clearly you're not a local boy. Would you uh -huh. like to tell us where you're from? I was born in Bogota, Colombia, and I was there until I was 25. I went to school in, in Colombia before I came here. I was going to the university, and I was doing biology and art. That was my major. Why at age 25 did you come here? I came here because my life in Colombia was very difficult. Uh, politically, it was uh, challenging for me. I was very vocal in terms of the politics, and they made my life unpleasant, to say the least. Uh -huh. And so I came here, uh, my brother lives in Orlando, so I went to, uh, to Florida and went to school, and I went to art school, and then I went to uh, rehabilitation counseling as a master's degree on a, it's a humanistic psychology program. So, uh -huh. so I have done psychology, art, and science. So that's pretty much kind of my background in terms of formal education. And it sounds like it's where you still are. I'm still doing all of them, yes, correctly. I'm still a psychotherapist, I'm an artist, and I do a lot of consulting with, uh, at this point, with small profit and non-profit organizations as a mm -hmm. management consultant, yes. So are we going to be looking at art that is fairly recent? Most of the art that is here started around 2000, including this guy. Uh huh. Do you want mm. to just give me a quick rundown well, of what you I, might have been doing before that? Well, I, uh, what I was doing before that was, a, no, I don't have anything here about that, but it was very much kind of the, in the view of art therapy, basically my emotions on paper or on clay or on any material that I could find and my dreams. I did a lot of dream work. Uh -huh. uh, so it's all personal and symbolic. Did you keep it all? Yeah, I have it all. So it, f yeah. it functions like a diary? Uh, yeah, it's actually all in a wall. It's about this thick <laughs> of papers. In a wall? You on, hide it in a wall? It's on a wall right now. Oh, on a wall? On a wall. Not in a wall. On a wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on, on a wall, um, you know. And I look at it here and there, I mean, but it's all, now it's historical, I don't uh -huh. refer to it. It's been integrated into my being right now. Uh -huh. There's no, no need to go there because I, I continue dreaming and I continue painting. So. Uh -huh. But my painting, the more um, formal painting, which is mostly uh, oil and watercolors and sculptures, um, they're all very personal. Uh -huh. They are coming from something that is highly in, important for me and significant. Well, you're going to have to explain to me how, how painting Emily Dickinson is highly personal. Well, I mean, I'm a uh, stranger in a stranger land, right? Yes. And Emily Dickinson seems to be the 
from the Catholic perspective, we have saints in different cities, but Protestants don't have saints. But Emily Dickinson is the closest that I can relate to the saint from Amherst, uh -huh. Saint Emily. So uh, <laughs> I, with that, and, and she reminds me of many of the um, 18, 1700 writers uh, from Spain and Italy that were nuns that they find a place of reclusive place to do their writings. And Emily, for me, kind of fit into that place, and I got very interesting, uh -huh. especially about her as, as a teenager. Um, uh -huh. Because the, the only photograph we have of Emily Dickinson is at age 16. So when I saw this black and white uh, photo of Emily Dickinson, which is not more than this big, I mean, it's like three by four, maybe three by three inches, and it's a daguerreotype, I decided to make it bigger. And I research every detail of that photograph, the color, the materials, the uh, flowers that she's holding, uh, and discover a Victorian reality behind and part of the Industrial Revolution in the U.S. in terms of textiles oh. and why uh, most women were really dressed up quite well yes. because uh, textiles were made cheap at that time and it was kind of a, a place where women were able to dress up something that didn't happen before that in the U.S. So it's a significant time, moment in time, and I learned a lot about being connected to Emily Dickinson and connect to the museums here and connect to the folks here. So it was one way to integrate myself into the culture here. I am astounded by this <laughs> story. So yes. tell us, what are these flowers? The flowers are orange blossoms, and in the Victorian they have a symbolism of being a blossom at the same time that is a flower. They have both uh, a fruit and a flower. A the, fruit the and a flower. But do we have orange blossoms in this area? No. no. So they're props from they're props. the same as the book that is on the table and the tablecloth, which is also... Were you able uh, to tell what the book was? It appears to be a Bible. Yes. And the tablecloth, it appears to be a German... I forgot the name of the... Pr it's a print. Ah. And it has some eagles in it and some... Um, have you shared this information that you've yeah, worked I, on I with wrote the it. I, I, Emily Dickinson Museum? It is, it, uh, that piece is not at the Emily Dickinson Museum. That piece is at the Jones Library. Uh, I, uh, if they're interested, I'm sure I will share more information uh -huh. with them. I'm sure they will. And this is, around her neck is a ribbon with a pin? A ribbon with a pin. I couldn't figure out what the pin was, but the ribbon is actually the type of ribbon that they will use when they're in mourning. And apparently her grandfather oh. had passed away a few months before that, so she was holding that ribbon as a sign of mourning. I see. Well, having integrated yourself <laughs> with, the, with the local um, poets, yes. if not people, yeah. uh, the next picture here, and this is oil, right? And it's, it's oil huge. on canvas, yes. This is what, 44 feet tall? 38 by, what is it, 36 by 48. 3 by 4 feet. Yeah. So it went from a small daguerreotype to that size. To that size. Yes. That's quite astounding, Guillermo. Um, next to it, we have a picture of the Connecticut Valley, Connecticut River. Well, I mean, that's another very personal, I live here, you know. I look at... Um, you well, live in Sunderland? I live in Sunderland. And Wait, I, I didn't ask you. Well, let's get, let's <laughs> stop for a minute. Yeah. How did you get from Florida, you, Bogota, Colombia, to Florida, to New Amherst? England. New England? Well, How? originally to Leverett. To Leverett, of going, course. Going backwards, <laughs> I came here to connect with a fellow, uh, Jack Canfield, the chicken soup guy, I call it. Oh, chicken soup for the soul, yeah. Chicken soup for the soul. Uh, he was a gestalt therapist at that point. He was doing some training in gestalt therapy. And I came here and I ended up doing some training with him in a workshop that he was doing at that time. And this is and 1975. And I, well, then I got interested in the, in the, uh, the UMass, uh, the school of it was at that point, at that point very interesting. And so I stayed because they have a lot in terms of uh, 
the social justice and a lot in terms of the humanistic psychologies, which, mm -hmm. which in Florida I was part of the kind of the, I was a yoga teacher, I was doing uh, gestalt therapy, I was very involved in the kind of personal growth, humanistic psychology movement at that point. Without poking too much fun at ourselves, this is the place to be if those are the, your interests. Well, I came here to somebody that was in this yeah. area, and, and I stayed because the UMass provided the rest of the education that I wanted. And I ended up having a, a doctorate in creativity, believe it or not. A doctorate in creativity. Yeah, organizational development and creativity. Uh huh. I'll have to consult so, you later. That, I was one of the few people <laughs> that graduated from that program. There's other, there's other folks that I know too. Uh -huh. So tell us about this painting, which is much smaller. It seems very interesting that you should take a, a tiny picture of Emily Dickinson and make her huge and take a vast view of the Connecticut River looking from Sugarloaf Mountain. Yes? Is that from Sugarloaf? Well, yeah. I mean, this painting came out And make it fast. quite small. This painting happened real fast, is what happened. It started as a plein air, and then I finished it inside. But it came out almost instantaneously. It was... Uh, it is also oils. It's also oils, yeah. It is a very fast, and I like what happened with the, the, the texture of the colors is, is quite loose and it's very nice. Yes, it is loose. Yeah. Yes. If one gets close, it's almost impressionistic. Yes, uh, that's correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so that I really like that painting because of that. Well, now we have a few portraits. Would you well, like to... Well, inspired by Emily Dickinson, <laughs> I decided to do portraits of people that were close to me. Uh-huh. And who are these? So do you want to tell us who these people the, are? Well, the children are the, my nephews. Now they're grown up now. They're, they're both. Uh, one has just got married, and the other one is going to the university. Who gets to have that painting? The father, the mother and the father has the painting. Uh-huh. And so... And, I did and, and that's quite large, too. Yes, I forgot that. It looks the, like the it's the almost four feet tall. Yeah, it's a... Th what is it? I forgot that 30 size. by 40, you Something like that, yeah. According to your notes here. Yes. And this is oil. Yeah, that's an oil. Are uh, you working from a photograph? On that one, I, I did. I, I, I would think it would be hard to keep these two children in that position. Well, what I did was very much engage them in a process of finding out how the relationship was. Between them. Between them, and then engage them in talking about their relationship. And we came out with kind of a portrait of the emotional or the energy connection that they had. It's very lovely. What is the age difference between these two children? Oh, God, maybe about three or four years, something uh -huh. like that, yeah. And she's holding, I think, a teddy bear. Yes. Yeah. So she's quite young. Uh, it's not a teddy bear, but it's a, uh, a rabbit. Something, yes. I forgot the name of the rabbit. That's it, okay. They'll kill me for not remembering, but that's okay. I tried. There were lots of rabbits out last night. <laughs> I tried speaking to them. I tried all sorts of names. They don't seem to matter. It doesn't matter to them. No, but they did. She was very attached to, I uh, see. to the little rabbit. Uh -huh. and, and this is oil. That's oil. And, and those photographs were done at the Cape when we used to go together and have vacations. So that's uh -huh. the background is the Cape. So, so that's the kind of the connection with New England and landscapes. Th they show up in the background. At this point on the paintings, on the portraits. Are you telling me that if I asked for another call to artists for landscapes, you'd give me this as a landscape? No. No, okay. <laughs> All right. <let's laughs> no, but it's because how the this one was in the land landscape yeah, show. Yeah, that one definitely yeah. was. But okay. they, they start creeping out in the portraits. So uh -huh. it's very funny. So there's, a, there's an interesting landscape behind the gentleman on the next image here. What, what is, uh, this is a little smaller. Who is that? This is, actually, this is 18 by 24, my friend Steve, which I'm still very good friends with him. And that's kind of the ocean on the background. He has a house in the Cape also. And this also, that painting was one of the, my favorite because I think I finished it in one day it looks to me like it's almost posed. It doesn't look like a photograph. Uh, I would say mixture. Uh huh. So and uh, that again, you know, this is the, the this is one of the best uh, portraits I think in terms of capturing somebody's character. Yes. 
Uh, and I think it has to do with my connection that I have with him. So are you saying that portrait artists who are hired, who don't know who they're painting, would have perhaps a very accurate representation of what they see, but they wouldn't capture the character? I, I don't know about that, but in terms of what's important for me is to establish a good connection. I mean, basically what, when I interview the people that I was doing portraits, as I was taking photographs, I always said to them, like, imagining where is the best place in which your energy, your spirit, your soul has actually has been, ful been fulfilled. The place that you feel full presence of your body, in your body. And so out of that, and I can see you're smiling already. There is a sense. It's very interesting. There's a, there's a sense. And so I start taking photographs from this place that is very precious internally about what really makes you happy, that it is the ability to be present in the world. So I, I do the portraits from that perspective. I, I'm smiling because I think it's very clever. <laughs> I see how it works. <laughs> it works, of it's course. It's very clever to get people to get to that place changes perhaps the way they stand, the way... It changes the conversation with themselves and with me. But there might be a, a, ch a change in the physicality. Of course, well. totally, yes. I don't want to break um, anonymity, but one wonders, I wonder where he went. And you don't have to say because perhaps you don't even know, but I wonder where he went. Um, you know, that's, I don't remember what he said. But oh, he actually told you? Of course. Oh. Oh. You know, all this is very interactive and very alive uh -huh. in the moment. Uh -huh. There's a way with his head is slightly tilted that makes it not formal, even though it looks quite formal. Mm. It's like a secret going on between. We have a little secret going on. Well, you know, he is a very, I call him mischievous. I mean, he has a great sense of humor. And that part of his personality is uh, clearly there. He's a very social person and has a great sense of humor. Uh, and he has a sense of humor of uh, kind of the jokes, not the jokester, but... Um, um, I can see it in the, it, it the little... Pull, it, 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 it puts reality in a context of like, like uh, life is, could be more fun than what it is. He's about to smile. Yeah, exactly. Now the next portrait is, I would call it a double portrait. What it do is, you think? It, it is a triple actually, a double. A triple no, no, portrait. No, 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 it's not true. It's double, yes. Okay. I'm talking about the flower, but anyway. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> in that case, it's a triple portrait. <laughs> okay, so now this, this is a different world. This is... Um, what do we call this? Her name is Kiran. This is the... Kiran? Uh, she's pregnant with her first child. And the, the difficult part about this is that she actually passed away. She actually died of cancer. But she had the child. She had the child and she had another child after. And so way after that, you made about this three picture. years. I did the picture when she was pregnant. Oh. But she passed away many years after. No, I did the picture right away when, when she was pregnant. And she brought one day, she brought, this is the spring of 19, no, 2003, I think, or four or something, I forgot, maybe 2004. And she brought the flower, and so out of that, we, it came out with, with this. She is half Canadian, half Pakistani. Mm -hmm. So we were playing with the different cloth that she likes that are part of her heritage. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was one moment of when in, in terms of what was important and she put her hand on her belly and she was very inside herself feeling the little baby kicking. And, I that, think and that's what that painting is about. That connection, inner connection. I think what interests me very much about the painting is the center of it is these three objects, the right hand, the mm -hmm. left hand, and the left foot, 
her left foot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these are, interestingly enough, your hands and your feet are very intimate parts of a body. Mm. More than your leg, mm. more even mm. than a pregnant belly somehow. And yeah. sometimes even more than a breast. Because a breast, I mean, it's a breast, but a hand has all your personality. It does, it. yeah. And, uh, and for that to be the center of the picture is very interesting to me. There's a well, lot of detail in the center, the whereas the other parts are more sort of large panels. And she's floating. She's not sitting on anything. There's no horizon. There's no... She's just like hanging there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's move on to the other thing. I see two with hawks. Are they hawks? Uh, eagles? Yes, there is actually, those are the... One's an eagle, one's a hawk? No, they're both eagles. I mean, they're both hawks, sorry. The, uh, these are small. These are watercolors. Okay. So I made them about, you know, the size. Yeah. To change the point, which paper was, paper was available. Yes, that's a good uh, technique. <laughs> <laughs> Perfectly legitimate technique. The, the story, I, I made a book, it's called Freedom from Traps, and it has, and so the first image is the cover for the book. And the, and the last image is the last image of the story of the book, when the uh, hawk is, fr is freed from a trap, and this is a... Uh, this really it? happened to you? This happened, yes. I was driving to go and do errands and I saw my neighbor walking down the street with a hawk in front of, of her that was leaping back and up and down. So I stopped to figure out what it was and she reminded me that there was a clicking sound and she looked and we looked and there was this uh, foothold trap that the, drag the, the, um, the uh, hawk was dragging around. Oh. And I felt this amazing sense of like injustice. I mean, that triggered all of my social whatever work that I'd done. And, uh, and I said to the hawk, I put my hand in my heart and I said, listen, let me take it off. If you trust me, you'll let me. And I kept saying that, if you trust me, you'll let me. Let me take it off. And then all of a sudden the hawk goes on his back, opens his wings and it stretches his talons. And it's on his back with a beak open. And I said, oh my God, this thing is taking me seriously. <laughs> <laughs> so I kneeled down, very scary, with my left hand, tried to take the trap off, but it was too hard. So I needed to do this. So now I'm like really close to the hawk. Uh -huh. Took the, tra the trap off, checked to see if the talon was fine. Move away, and I said, okay, get up. So he got up on top of a little piece of wood that was there on the ground. And we stared at each other for a long time. And we had this amazing communication of like, thanks, kind of being grateful of each other. And I said, you know, you can leave now. I got the trap, you can go. And he looked at me, looked away, looked at me and took off. And so the last picture is when he took off. So it has a lot of color because it was kind of a celebration of flight. And where is this book? Oh, this book is always oh, printed by something that's called blurb.com. Is uh, is the print? I have, there's a print right here. Well, where uh, do, where does one get the book? At blurb.com. Oh. It's called b l u r b dot com. Uh huh. And if you put my name in it, it will. So there'll be other people put make anybody books? anybody can uh, order a book. At any time, oh. it's print on demand. Print on demand. Yes, it's self-printed, as they call it. Wonderful. Okay, so <laughs> we move on, right? We move on. I mean, that's what we're doing here. You know, the, we can we could keep talking, but then we'd be losing the opportunity to to discuss these last two and this one here behind us, which is enormous. So, which would you like to talk about first? Well, let's keep in order. Let's okay, stay with, okay. with that one, which okay, is... Okay, these are huge, too. Well, and we actually have only one of them here, and the other is a little snapshot. So and a snapshot on time. I mean, so yeah. basically this is to show the development of this one. This, like most of the art that I've done privately, so this is a combination of my private art with a more public. And it has to do with... Uh, I started painting this ball 
in front of the, my house. Basically, the sun set in my house. At that time, I was diagnosed with having a sarcoma, a big ball that was in my stomach. I didn't know that, but I made the connection that that, that was what's going on. Uh -huh. So I went through surgery and through the recovery, and then the painting kept shifting, and the ball went away and it became a glow, and the field turned into an ocean, and the ocean was connected to a dream that I had while I was in recovery in after or during the hospital, actually, in the hospital stay, I had this dream of being in Cape Cod, sailing in this calm water. So this painting, all of a sudden, translated by itself. I mean, the way that I paint, especially the things that come out of my mind. They're These not, are oils, yes. They're oils, but they're imaginary. They're not, they're real, but they're not. Yes. Right. In a sense that they are from real images that I have experienced, but they're not real in front of me. So this is a wonderful, wonderful conclusion to It, it to is, the, absolutely. It's yeah. a point of, of the healing from that, and, uh, and that's what it was. Let's turn from that wonderful moment to this other wonderful this moment. This one is after that, after I finally recovered from surgery, and it, this is like the sunrise in spring. So this is the spring after the surgery and the sense of liveliness in New England, and this could be any tree you want to be. Is this, be. is this an imaginary place too? It is imaginary place, but some people think this is Quabbin, and you know, it could be anything in New England. It's definitely New England, it's not. It's but not, it's, it's not a specific place. It's, it's a place not, here. It's not a specific place, no. Oh. It's, a, it's a symbolism of how I was feeling after I recovered from, you feel it, from that. I feel that you felt. <laughs> Wonderful, it, it is renewed, truly, and, truly. and full of life. Truly renewed, yes. Well, this has been a renewing experience for me. I don't. I know some of your work, and it's been. It's always a lovely discovery to see the rest of some artist's work. And um, I feel privileged to have been let in and to find out. I think everybody's work can be personal, but we don't always know it. Or it could be not personal, and we don't always know it. But to hear the story behind the pieces gives it a tremendous amount of meaning. For instance, the Emily Dickinson just looks like an Emily Dickinson painting. But to hear your background story to it is, is profound and wonderful. Oh, thank you. And I thank you very much for sharing your art with us and some of your story. And uh, thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much, Jane. Thank you also for being with us. This was an interview with Guillermo Cuellar, and we are at the Deerfield Arts Bank, which is a closed place for the summer right now. But uh, we'll see you next week and next week after that, each week with a different artist. Thank you for joining us.